Hey Anton, welcome to yeah, HexFM. Hello Adam, nice to see you again. People don't know that we see each other, but we can. Yeah, um, you said again, uh, but uh, have we ever, ever met really and talked to, uh, to each other? Adam, you probably don't remember, but we got a Java 1 Rockstar Award together for, for the talk that we delivered uh, together with Max Anderson in 2014. With Max Anderson? Yeah, it was about the IDs. It was NetBeans, uh, Eclipse, ah. and IntelliJ. And it was three of us there. It was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> I, I I forgot about uh, about the, the IDE, IDE shoot, shootout. It was at the community day or was regular Java 1? It was a regular Java 1. Okay. Hey, good to know. So, um, <laughs> because I, I I thought... Uh, I, so, with NetBeans, usually I spend lots of time at the community day on Monday. You know, where I completely forgot that there was another talk at the regular Java 1, but it's good to know. And um, yeah. I still use uh, NetBeans. Um, I would use NetBeans a bit more. The problem is, you know, the JavaScript stuff. So, um, so I don't like to switch between backend and frontend. And yeah, but forget about Rockstars. Uh, what's <laughs> more interesting is what was your first computer? My first computer, the first computer I've got at home wasn't mine, actually, of course. It was uh, my father's computer and it was 1997 and it was Pentium 2, 223 gigahertz mm -hmm. or megahertz. Megahertz, it was. Megahertz. Yeah, it had, I don't remember. Uh, 233, right, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I also and, had this and, one. And I don't remember how much memory it had, but it was a pretty kind of top top tier uh, consumer device, let's say. Then at that time. 32 Max, I guess, because um, my was 8 Max, 16 was more, and 32, I think, was already, you know, the, the higher bar. And I think Workstation at 64, as I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like Megs, that. Megabytes, megabytes. We're talking about megabytes, no gigabytes, right? Right. But then uh, the computer was pretty much just standing on, on the uh, table. I wasn't interested in programming at that time. So I used it for games and uh, mm -hmm. occasionally. Games? I think at 1997, I think it was uh, EA Sports, uh, FIFA or NHL, something like that. Okay. I never liked such games. Sport games. I don't know why. I think this is a no. This is like I don't know. I just wanted you know some fantasy stuff or whatever. But I didn't like you know to to have some something with sports on the computer, because um, I started earlier and uh, the sports games back then you always destroy the joystick because oh, you yeah. have to move very fast. You know, and this is I think it, now it's different. But back then I said okay, this is. Uh, I I broke a few joysticks uh, at that time. Uh, I remember in some uh, console game, a few of them actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, so so 1997. This is already uh, so you are a youngster. I was 16. Okay, yeah, and I was uh, very fond of sports. That's why I played sports game. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you started, at least you know to open the console or terminal. So what was your transition between gaming and doing something? different or something more how to call it more creative or whatever uh it was a co-accident so let's say uh, let's call it like that uh i mm -hmm. graduated from sports school and uh sports I was, school so yeah. wait, wait a second what, what you did at sports school i well i did sports basically yeah, but the what? only thing you do uh, swimming ah okay swimming i did a lot of swimming i was part of the national team junior national, national team, team. Yes. Uh, uh, was it was it like a crawl or uh... butterfly and crawl, both? Okay. And how long? Uh, okay, this is interesting. And because uh, I never met a, uh, someone who who did you know competitive swimming, so how was your day or your training? Is it like you you had to train a lot or what? What was it? Or yes, yeah, swimming is uh, is a nasty sport uh, sport in in terms of volume that you have to do on the trainings. And uh, at that time, it was basically morning, evening, morning, evening, six days a week. Oh, so all, all and, together. And all together about uh, four, four and a half hours. Per day? Uh, a day, yes. So basically you swim and you um, sleep at, at the classes and then 
you swim again and you go back home and you sleep again. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it was about six years of such intense uh, pace. Uh, and when I graduated, I didn't want to do any sports after that. So I was looking for something else uh, to change my... I didn't know what I want to do. And uh, accidentally, uh, wait, I... Yeah, I... Uh, wait a second. I'm just really interested in the swimming. So the training, you just had to swim or you had, you know, do an interval training or you just... Or what is... Or oh. you had, you know, to spend time... Or did you are running or was just about swimming? So I'm just curious to know what is a swim training? So I, Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I can explain. Um, probably it's different now. It, it, 20 years has passed, so uh, it might, might be that the plans are now different. Uh, but at that time, it was like, let's say, morning training uh, would look mm -hmm. something like one kilometer of... Um, uh, warm up, so you basically just swim to get into the pace, and then the interval training starts. Uh, various series, let's say uh, ten times one hundred meters in uh, the regime of uh, one minute thirty seconds. So basically, you swim in one twenty. You have ten seconds to breathe, and you go again. So that's the interval training in swimming. It's not like you swim for one minute and then you uh, rest for one minute. That's that's not the interval training you get in, in swimming. Um, and uh, there are some and accelerations. How long, uh, 100 meter? 100 meter, how long do you, uh, you need for 100 meters? Uh, you mean know, um, max or in... Yeah, in the in, interval training, you know, in the interval in the, training. In the inter interval training, uh, normally it would be something like 1 minute 15 seconds, 1 minute 12 seconds, okay. something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are accelerations, there are technique trainings where you swim various uh, drills, let's call them like that. Um, uh, what else? Training, training the... Uh, Rotation, how you call it, mm -hmm. like okay. So the, you know, switching directions, right? Yeah, yeah, switching directions. Um, then there are various uh, styles, right? If you swim multiple styles, you need to exercise them all. Mm -hmm. uh, in like the morning training is basically just about swimming. The evening training usually was al also about the workout strength. Uh, so you do mm -hmm. some gym or running, and after that you would repeat uh basically the morning training but with some variation of it okay. and and it goes in cycles of course like there are micro cycles let's say you have three weeks you have three weeks until the competition for the two weeks you're going to be growing the uh volumes and then the week before the competition you probably uh start you know doing less of uh mm -hmm. strength and uh accelerations but but more on techniques and and the relaxing so that you are not pumped before the actual start. Mm -hmm. and how good were you? Uh, I didn't break any records, so I I don't consider myself being good. But uh, I got into the national team at that time, and uh, I once was lucky to win uh, the national contest in in medley in four hundred medley. Uh, what is medley? I, it's like. Uh, 400 meters, uh, there are four styles. So mm -hmm. it's butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, and freestyle. Mm -hmm. So they all go in 100 meters, and uh, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a combination. It's combined mm -hmm. swimming. Okay. And I, 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 I won it because the other two guys didn't show up. Like or they, they had their own other uh, stars to do, so they didn't uh, do this 400 medley exactly. So I was lucky to win. <laughs> but you were not alone in the competition. Just your the main competitors were not there, right? But yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, I would be second without any, you know, talent. Swimming, so. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's true. And usually, when I was in the team, uh, the team contests in swimming are uh, organized in in such a way that there is a uh, the best in the team who swims mm -hmm. that specific contest, and then um, the number two person who goes to the same contest, his task is not to win but not to lose. You see, okay. if number one should win, and number two should should try not to lose. Should n okay. try not to be the last one. So usually, if let's say we have three countries competing to each other. Mm -hmm. Then um, 
from each country you would get two swimmers all together six swimmers basically that's one heat that swims swims mm -hmm. the distance and my task would be not to be the last okay and In, why not to win if you win what will happen then big well that would be the uh, very good that would be very good but uh Normally, number one is actually, you know, uh, uh, much better. Well, much better or ahead, like enough ahead that I wouldn't catch him. That's usually the okay. situation. But sometimes the two uh, swimmers who swim for the same distance, uh, they might be uh, like very equal, and then there okay. are, there is a competition. Yes. Ah, I understand. Because uh, you 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 swim at the same time, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> so you you should be better than the other countries, and you have no chance to beat the first one. Okay. Now I mm -hmm. now I learned something. So I never. Uh, this is why I'm asking because I have no idea about swimming. So um, wait wait a second. But there is an Ironman competition triathlon, and yeah. I think how how far they are swimming uh, one kilometer or something as well, right? You uh, know that the Iron Ironman is three point eight kilometers. Kilometers. Yes. Uh, how that's... long you will take? How 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 you know this? I no like they swim uh, in fifty five. I I guess good swimmers swim below uh, one hour faster than mm -hmm. one hour, mm -hmm. but it 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 depends very much on the weather conditions because they yeah, swim okay. in the open water and mm -hmm. um, depends if there are yeah. streams, if there are waves and so on. But they are good swimmers, right? As well, so the time is yeah, good. Yeah, sure. Or sure. Okay. Because I thought the note was not that good because they also have to run and you know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like uh, in in the swimming pool, of course, they swim faster. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, really, because they have you no know, to how to call it to change the direction. Is it not? Mm. Is not better to swim open water? Normally, no. In in the swimming pool, you get uh, some acceleration when you ah, push yeah. push from right. the yeah right. Yeah. yeah, and and also in the swimming pool, you don't really look up or down or to the sides you have learned but you have learned it by heart you can swim in with in in the pool with uh closed eyes ah, basically really this this is my question so uh you can you can you can use you are swimming in pool with closed eyes kind of you you, do, you don't rely on the eyes that much because okay. you swim all the time you know when you have to do the last stroke to actually start the turn mm -hmm. so it's so automatic it becomes automatic over time. Okay. And why you started swimming? So just you, you want it or? Because my parents decided that I have to do that. It's, it ah, wasn't, okay. And your, your parents it, were swimmer. Are swimmer your parents? My mother was. And uh, well, ah, in, okay. in the beginning, it's not your decision. But then you get used to that. And I, I was very motivated because I started to win early. Like mm -hmm. at the age of seven. And I was like, I won for the first time. And I was, uh, I, I was so... Uh, excited about it that I wanted to win again and again. Okay. And when, and and this disappeared at the age of seventeen or eighteen, uh, like after ten years or twelve years of like competitive mm -hmm. swimming, and then I I I had the situation that hey I probably don't want to do that anymore, and then all my all my uh, progress stalled basically that was a plateau and um, i did not progress anymore so i was but it was still good time demotivated right? this was a cool stuff right? yeah yeah it was kind of a very good life uh school i would say yeah exactly yeah it's an interesting story so uh really so um it yeah should be not uh yeah hacks this is like almost like water hacks today right so what, <laughs> what we can do <laughs> Okay, yeah. so now I understand. So uh, and then you 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 wanted you know to be have some something more focused and not you know in in a in a dry conditions and warm and computer was the perfect. Uh, like I I didn't know that I wanted to do computers. I was basically looking for the next place to study and uh, I wanted to get the higher education. That was my the the only thing I knew. I wanted to uh, study something, something technical. So uh, I, I filed my resume to to the technical university. And why not sports and become a trainer or whatever? So why technical? I was sick of sports. I was just okay. Like I 
didn't want to do that uh, anymore, like in any form, like not okay. even a trainer, a coach or anything like that. Okay. But right now you will be the hero, right? Because you, you could, you know, uh, do some YouTube uh, channel with that and have some sponsors. <laughs> or now it could be a completely different trajectory, maybe. Uh, have, yeah. have you had sponsors back then or something? Sponsors or? No, no, no. Like basically you, you get a sponsor. Uh, like at that time you could get a sponsorship uh, if you... Uh, if your results are at the level of master of sports, I I, I didn't uh, reach there okay. by the end of uh, graduating the school, so I didn't get any sponsorships, and and that's rare. Basically, this is something you, like a few people get at that age. Okay. So th- this this is what well, this wasn't something in the end, uh, late nineties. This wasn't something that you can live with and uh, don't okay. think about education or any career path or anything like that so so like basically my thoughts were that what do i do next so that mm-hmm. i would be in short about my you know further life and uh, i decided to go to the university and uh, it just was a coincidence that the u- technical university uh there was a competition to get in of course mm-hmm. and uh at the day before the study started, uh, they called me and said, "Hey, we have one free spot left, and, and you can fit in." Cool. So, so I got into the computer engineering, which wasn't about programming that much, and I didn't think that I will be programming until I think two thousand one. Okay. So, uh, like, of course, we started programming like from from day one there but uh in pascal mm-hmm. turbo it's Pascal's. not bad actually i like pascal it turbo was pascal, i guess fun yeah turbo pascal seven zero it was mm-hmm. like the blue screen mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. like that and mm-hmm. and and then it was also another coincidence that i i um, decided to go as an exchange student to swedish university and where where was it in Sweden? Uh, it was uh, in uh, Mallerdalens Högskola, which is located in uh, Westeros. Okay, no idea where and it is. Is it near Gothenburg? Or... It's in. It's exactly in the center of Sweden, between Stockholm and Gothenburg. Not bad. So, okay. Yeah. So, like, there's just a small university, but it's very industrial city where it's mm-hmm. located. So all the Big industry uh, companies like ABB, Ericsson mm-hmm. have have their offices or plants there, mm-hmm. and uh, the uh, the university is uh, interesting in a way that uh, you get a lot of teachers or lecturers ex- from those companies, mm-hmm. and they teach you very practical things how to do stuff in in real world. So there, I started with Java. Pretty cool. Which which right. version? Uh, we when we started the course, it was Java one point three. But okay. I think but I think we switched in the middle uh, to Java one four, and mm. uh, the primary reason for us was that uh, in Java one four on swing buttons we could put icons. In one mm. three it wasn't possible. In one four it was possible, and we ex- we needed that exactly for the project we were. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing uh, for 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 this software engineering course, and uh, it was interesting in a way that it wasn't like uh, you you are not given uh, the assignment to do that alone. Mm-hmm. The assignment is given for a group, so the whole group is doing it. It's about mm-hmm. seven eight people, and okay. all the roles should have been covered, like the developer, the designer. They were teaching waterfall. They didn't know about Agile at that time. But it doesn't matter. All the roles were covered and we could get the uh, idea of how uh, the real work looks like in, in, in the industry that you have someone uh, like a professor, but professor w- was playing the customer role, right? Then there is a steering committee who checks your 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 progress and how you are doing, mm-hmm. uh, clarifying the requirements. Then in the group there is a project manager. There are developers. There are testers. There is a group of folks who would be assigned to do calculations because it was about um, simulating some physical process. Mm-hmm. So and, and it was interesting in a way that that's the main course that you are doing at the university because it's very different from the university in Tallinn where I was studying and uh, 
they give you this project and whatever else you need to complete this project, you go and find the course for that. So if you need math, you go to that okay. math course. If you need some special, I don't know, chemistry, mm -hmm. then you go to study chemistry to uh, complete that. Study course. or just take, you know, the class? Uh as I understood, study. Okay. I I, I didn't go to the math uh, class. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, you 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 take the class. I mean, you study one class for that specific area. Yeah. That you okay, need. is what I thought. Mm -hmm. And was it uh, was the university harder than in Tallinn or similar or you know the what was the level? Uh, the no the the level was the same. I would say okay. like it's similar. Uh, in my mind, but the the whole process was different. Uh -huh. So at, in Tallinn, we were not that focused. You would have very different subjects uh, or classes during yeah. the semester, and you have to switch a lot. In Germany, the same. In Sweden, it was very focused, and everything it's more happened. Fun, right? This is more like real world. I mean, do the project, and if you have no idea, then you have to learn, right? I mean, this was very, yeah. very pragmatic. Yeah, like that's the right word. Mm -hmm. Right, and you enjoyed that, or yeah, I, I I felt like after this, I knew what I'm gonna be doing. Like I, at in Tallinn University, when I was switching between the courses, I didn't really have it in mm -hmm. mind that whom I will become. Like, okay. what will I do after the university? I knew I will be uh, skilled as an engineer. I could do some design mm -hmm. and programming, but uh, I didn't know how exactly my work mm -hmm. would look like after Swedish university I was I had pretty good idea what what mm -hmm. it will be cool and uh, what I wanted to ask you um okay so you started programming at the university before university you had no programming skills or no 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 no, no. interesting actually so yeah actually, I was pretty uh, late I was pretty late on the party yes mm -hmm. interesting so that, uh, but I mean, who cares, right? Because uh, if you are motivated, and maybe in your case, you 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 had enough, you know, of the entire sport. So it was uh, interesting, you know. I say, okay, I do completely different, and and with your sports persistence, or how to call it, motivation, because you had to be motivated, you know, to be ten years on the pro level swimming. So with the same determination, if you start to programming, you know, there is you can achieve a lot. Yeah, I think it was like how you call it stubbornness, like when mm -hmm. I didn't when it was interesting but I didn't know like how to cope with that. It was hard. I thought like, "Oh, okay, it's hard, but I just have to work harder mm -hmm. to to achieve and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, learn stuff and to be professional with that." So mm -hmm. this was kind of a, this sporting motivation, I would say. Yes. It's still on and and still I would say Easier than pro pro sports, right? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely yes. Yeah. Hey, cool story. And, and what you build with the uh, icons on the swing buttons, or which kinds of software was it? Uh, it was um, the the assignment, as I remember correctly. It was um, you know in Stockholm they have this uh, Vasa museum with the Vasa ship is water mm -hmm. with, with the ship the, mm -hmm. the the big ship that sank in the 15th century or whenever it was. So mm -hmm. they had uh, very ugly simulators uh, where you could um, kind of reconfigure the ship deck and uh, mm -hmm. play with cannons and how many decks there are and so on okay. and see if it sinks or not. Mm -hmm. So the assignment was to create a web-based simulator for this same software that they had. I don't know, probably created in the 80s or something like this. Mm -hmm. And... Um, where the user could, you know, uh, uh, select the uh, the hull, like the shape mm -hmm. of the hull, how many decks there are, how many uh, uh, stones there is on the like mm -hmm. in on the bottom deck, and so on. And then the whole calculation had to be done with the buoyancy, like with the re real physical wow. mm -hmm. uh, vectors, and so on. Like real, I mean, of course, it was simplified; it wasn't real science, but uh, at least it would give an impression that something mm -hmm. is simulated and the user would see how it's simulated, how those force vectors are 
you know uh, mm -hmm. turning and uh, how how would would the would this sh uh, ship uh, sink at the end or not and we of course we were build, were building it with applets mm -hmm. so we needed uh, buttons for selecting the hull selecting the cannons and so on so it would be nicer yeah uh, yeah just i thought not the entire time so why you needed swing i thought you know you build it configurator for the backend but of course applets were the thing back then mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. and so, it, it worked at the end or yeah yeah we we like there were six teams and five teams were building it with java and one team was building it with flash Mm -hmm. And uh, our team actually got the highest points. I think that Correct. was also the motivation for me uh, when when it was complete that we got it done and it was so nice. Mm -hmm. uh, at least we we got this um, grades, <laughs> and and oh, uh, and the professor said that uh, it was the best one. So I had like, oh, this is this is something I can work with. Now I go back and I will look for a job in this space. And uh, let's say Java paid my bills ever since. Okay, so uh, do you have on on your GitHub account the you know the source code? I I no no. Uh, I think I I need to I need to look into the uh, archives into email archives. I remember that someone emailed me the the sources. From that university, maybe I still have them, but I don't. You should save it. You know, you should archive this on GitHub, and you know, this is always it's that's, a good story. Actually, that's that's an interesting idea. I should do that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I would say. Um, okay, what happened after after the studies? So you said Java paid your bill. So what was your first bill, or no, for this bill? Uh, how to <laughs> call it? Your first money you got from a company? Uh, well, it was uh, right before, actually, right before the Swedish university. Um, I got some money for uh, writing some code in Perl, not in Java. Okay, but, we can but, we can cut it out, but uh, yeah. Keep, yeah. But after that, I was working in a small company that was building actually uh, a little product called Refactor It, and it was uh, a plugin for NetBeans. Oh, uh, yeah, and cool. it was re refactoring browser for NetBeans. At that time, it was pretty good. Uh, it was a commercial software, it wasn't open source, but I think uh, in a few years they stopped developing it and put everything, maybe even including the source codes, uh, to SourceForge.net. Uh, I think it's still there. Uh, but most of the money was uh, acquired by, I mean, like they were earning the money from uh, building a platform for uh, Telia Sonera. That's the big operator, and at the, it was a big operator at the time. It still is uh, under the Telia brand, mm -hmm. and uh, we were selling uh, polyphony and all kind of pictures and games for Java ME phones, oh, okay. Okay. Nokia. So, uh, like right after I started playing with Java ME, and I even developed a few games like very basic mm -hmm. ones. And very shortly after, I, I ended up at uh, developing enterprise software with Java EE, WebLogic. Um, Which version of WebLogic? It Ten. was, no, no, it was, I think it was 8. 8, eight, uh, eight was zero. still great. 8, I really like great. Uh, 8 was great, is what I to tell. And uh, and then it became you know larger and larger and, and worse. So, but I really yeah. like eight. Eight was like you know rocket science. It was fast and uh, and and lean, and it was surprising actually. Yeah, and it had it was coming with J Rocket J JVM as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, eight eight point zero eight point one were the um, the application servers I worked with most. So then it was two thousand three, I guess, right? Two thousand four. Four. Mm -hmm. 2004 and because uh, 2003 or four, I was at the BA World at the conference. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes. So it, when I started working with WebLogic, I think it was still called BA, but it was already like Oracle. Oh, okay. So it was coming from Oracle. Do you know what the first name was of BA WebLogic? What the server? What the name of the server was? No, I don't. I Tenga. Don't know that. Tenga. Tenga. Oh. Ten on Tenga was like you know neighbor island of Java. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, an interesting story. So yeah, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I didn't knew that you are enterprise developer. A cool story, actually. Yeah, it was uh, six years of my life was devoted to enterprise development, and actually, 
somehow I escaped web development. So Bia was was the application server that uh, was running the web applications, but I wasn't developing web applications there. Uh, mostly communications, or like let's say data pumping software. At that time, we didn't have Hadoop, we didn't have Spark or anything like that. Aqualogic, you use Aqualogic stuff? Aqualogic, uh, like no, 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 we didn't use that. And uh, for the most part, we were using BA because it was easier to deploy the software that we needed mm-hmm. to develop. It was the ETL processes basically that mm-hmm. started with Quartz job or with Cron mm-hmm. job. Mm-hmm. And uh, in that uh, environment, we had two platforms to develop for. Uh, Bia WebLogic was running on Solar Solaris uh, platforms, and then mm-hmm. we had the other platform, which was actually running the ETL processes, and that was mm-hmm. HP Unix. And oh. HP Unix development, like for that development, was harder in a way because it was a slightly different Java, and uh, the organizational let's say problems were also there that uh, forced us to trick the uh, system administrators and say that this is the web application, but we have to deploy it into web logic, but was it was actually doing ETL instead mm-hmm. of... Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and the reason why they wanted to deploy ETLs uh, into HP Unix because HP Unix was running or like the, the database was running there. And their argument was that the the ETL process should sit next to the database so that the data doesn't float through the network. Yeah. The thing was that the Java on HP Unix was so slow for our purposes that you can pump the same data through the network to uh, WebLogic instance running complete in completely different uh, da- mm-hmm. data data store in, or like mm-hmm. deployment basically, and still get it much faster. Uh, like the network wasn't an issue at that time anymore, but uh, all the mm-hmm. let's say internal Java SDK classes were the issue, especially the calendar when you have mm-hmm. to do a lot of calculations with dates. Like mm-hmm. calculating the next day in like or the difference between two dates in Java one mm-hmm. four was a very big nightmare. Like at the beginning of Java, the way Joe laugh, laughing is, uh, I, uh, I I measured you know the latency in a in a network and uh, in in several networks and I just ping something and the ping time was sometimes you no know, one hundred milliseconds. It was very slow, and I remember that, and I kept you know telling the story that the you know latency is bad and 100 milliseconds and you know 10 years later which was no more true and everyone says yes yes but in in one time you know in in in, in my clients in the projects like what are you talking about are you crazy pink time 100 milliseconds try it and i say you are right you know i did i just i remembered something <laughs> and keep telling the story you know for 10 right. years it was no more true and everyone thought i'm crazy so this is why the networks are actually incredibly fast. In one point of time, it was even faster to lock to a network instead of locking to a you know, local local file store. So sometimes, you know, networks are incredibly fast. Right. And, and well, at the end, still the organizational, like the political, uh, let's say, processes told us that, no, you have to deploy to, to HP Unix. Mm-hmm. And there I started to profile Which data you pumped up. back and forth? Which kind of data was it? Um, end of day data uh mostly about uh prices for the stocks no oh. or calculating the mortgages as well so that you Not get bad. you get like uh, an input uh, in one line and then you calculate all the payments uh forward for 30 years for mm-hmm. for one credit line Mm-hmm. And uh, it basically unfolded into millions of rows into the database every mm-hmm. every every day. It was a bank or a stock exchange? What was it? It was a bank. Okay. It was a local interesting bank. Interesting project, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the interesting part came when when we actually needed to profile, and um, it it's two thousand six seven, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time, we already had Spring, we already had Hibernate, we already had those modern frameworks that we exist today as de facto standards, right? And uh, when, like, in your goal, 
to organize or like to implement this batch process that will be run on the end of day for 30 minutes. You have 30 minutes window where the process has mm-hmm. to complete the performance, like the whole throughput. We didn't have this event-based architecture that when something changes in the system, you would pre-calculate. So we were not, we didn't have those capacities yet. We didn't have those processes and architecture in place yet. But still you, uh, so basically your your, your program needs to uh, do, like needs to show the raw power in 30 minutes, it has to complete and do all the work. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had situations when you deploy something and it doesn't complete in two hours or in 10 mm-hmm. hours even because there's so much data. And uh, yeah, like some, some of the issues were solved using like re-architecting the processes and like, this is the right way to do that. But Sometimes I, I was forced into profiling and optimizing the programs. And this is where it got interesting for me as an engineer. Like, like mm-hmm. you sit in the profiler, you, 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 run, mm-hmm. you run those profiling sessions, you try to micro-optimize the programs, like uh, re-implementing some of the JDK uh, classes or logic for, you know, for mm-hmm. squeezing mm-hmm. out better performance. And... Uh, I think this is where I got interested in in uh, the JVM tooling a lot. Okay. So when when I realized that after six years, basically not uh, quite quite a long time, but uh, when I re- realized that the domain is not that interesting for me, mm-hmm. uh, all this financial uh, and enterprise development and the developer tooling is what I admire mm-hmm. the most. Coaccidentally, uh, the founder of a small Estonian startup called Zero Turnaround, oh. uh, came to me and... Evgeny uh, Kabanov. Right. So I, I joined Jarable team and I started developing the plugin for IntelliJ. And uh, I was building the integration for, for the debugger, uh, kind of uh, fixing it, complementing it, developing it further. And at some point of time, we were growing. I, I When I joined, we were like five or six engineers only. So Java Rebel then was renamed to J Rebel, right? Exactly. When I joined, it was already called J Rebel. Okay. Yeah, 2010. And uh, yeah, like Evgeny promoted the me to... The funny story with, uh, with J Rebel and Java Rebel is the Evgeny wanted always to give me you no know, licenses. And I had hmm. the license, but the Glassfish was fast enough. And I say, okay, this... Nice, but you know, uh, I just use Glassfish. It's just fast enough, and uh, for me, it was just yeah. a, a fast deployment. And uh, yeah, but uh, a lot. It was crazy popular. So zero turnaround or the share level was was used everywhere. Actually, I I I cannot confirm, but I we were very pushy. I would say the the whole strategy was to build the business with this product, and we knew like or we suspected that uh, one day Java will be improved uh, either with the capabilities of the platform or just uh, the way we are developing the applications and then Jerable would not be a thing anymore. It still is. They still mm-hmm. sell it. And now it's part of Perforce. So it was acquired, mm-hmm. reacquired by Perforce. Uh, but I spent a few years with Jerable uh, as a product manager and then mm-hmm. I switched uh, into profiling. So we were building actually a profiler. At zero turn around? Yeah, so we called it x In the beginning, we had this idea that Jerable does the thing and mm-hmm. developers don't see what it, what it, what is it doing. And uh, they would say that, yeah, we have Jerable, but we don't need it because it seems that it's not doing anything, but because it's invisible, mm-hmm. right? It's, a, it's an mm-hmm. agent. Those are reloading the classes on the fly and uh, it's done. Like the only thing you would see is a log, fo- a log line somewhere in the console and mm-hmm. that's it. And probably you wouldn't see that. In, like depends. Mm-hmm. And uh, we we had this idea that we could visualize somehow what Jerable mm-hmm. is doing. And uh, we decided to build a plugin that would sit in Jerable and visualize the behavior of the application. Mm-hmm. And when we built this plugin, we uh, realized that, oh, that could be a separate product mm-hmm. because it actually shows, it's something in between the debugger and profiler. So mm-hmm. with the profiler, you would normally start your application, put some load on the application and um, wait, uh, like you would have a profiling session, right? 
Basically, mm-hmm. you would aggregate the results, find the hot spots, and then try to fix them. Uh, with Xtrable, our strategy was that uh, it should be always on, and it should just notify the user if something is wrong. But it's actually a good idea because Jarevel was hooked anyway, so you had you know to reload all the beans and anything. You had the, the absolute knowledge uh, what what you know the in which order watch has to be reloaded. So it is you could actually absolutely add you know some decorators or or aspects to to measure the performance, right? Exactly, and and we ended up building a profiler. Like at the beginning, we just wanted to visualize the behavior, like what happened, what just happened, to answer the mm-hmm. question, what just happened. But when we got some clients using it, uh, it turned out that uh, we can actually build a, a real profiler showing the call stack, you know, the mm-hmm. percentages and so on. Uh, of course, people started to ask for uh, like the hotspots, like please show mm-hmm. us the hotspots. I want. Uh, this method to run uh, not more than 20 milliseconds, for instance. But mm-hmm. if you are doing the instru- instrumenting profiler, uh, that's that doesn't make sense. It, mm-hmm. There are so many things that compete on your machine for for the CPU, so it's not it's not really reliable to say that hey, this method runs under or like above. 20 milliseconds that's just mm-hmm. it just doesn't make sense so we we, we stick with uh, showing the percentages so basically you would get an understanding that okay the request comes in I spend this much time on uh, fetching the data from the database this mm-hmm. much time on uh, transforming this data and this much time for rendering that's mm-hmm. basically it and there is a lot of tools like that like Microprofiler, for instance, which came from uh, .NET and uh, it was popular in the Ruby world with uh, Ruby on Rails. And then there is a lot of interesting profilers, web-based profilers, visualizing uh, the same information for PHP with the Zen Studio and uh, other products. And Django, for instance, has this Django development toolbar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Grails had its own vis- uh, way to visualize this performance data and metrics and so on. So, uh, And we built it in such a way that it's still an agent mm-hmm. and you don't have to configure anything. You just push the button, you open your web application, and the toolbar sits already as an overlay on top of your Mm-hmm. Uh, UI so that you mm-hmm. work with your UI, the toolbar is hidden, but when something goes wrong or something interesting, supposedly interesting is happening, you get notified, you get a notification like a small bulb or small yeah. notification that, hey, there's something interesting you you probably it's want a great to idea, take a look. Actually. Yeah. And, and it uh, was pretty I was, good. I was not aware of the profiler. What I was aware of, I was interested, was Live Rebel. Is, you know, the- yeah. It's it was kind of a mixture, like uh, on the edge. So we we were so we started with Jerable, right? And people, when they saw that we can reload the classes on the fly, uh, they were immediately interested in a live version of it. So yeah. for production, but when we actually implemented it, they were all scared that hey, you are doing this magic in production. How yeah. can you ensure that the change is compatible and what happens mm-hmm. with the state, what happens with this session and so on. Mm-hmm. And this is a great example of uh, people asking for something without knowing actually what they ask for. And this is where yeah. as a product manager or a product developer, you should stop and think before implementing. Yeah. Uh, so we had, I think, three pivots with uh, Life Rebel, with the way it was doing the updates. And uh, at the end, we came to um, a very nice implementation, I would say, actually, where uh, it was integrating with the application servers and the um, proxies, Mm -hmm. load load balancers, Mm -hmm. to implement rolling restarts, rolling updates, so that it was waiting until all the sessions are complete on one node, it would replace and restart the other mode and so on. So there wasn't gerable magic anymore. There wasn't this bytecode instrumentation anymore. The only instrumentation there was for controlling the server. So mm-hmm. basically like a watchdog. Hey, we are ready to restart the server. Let's restart it or redeploy the application depending on the implementation of the server. But uh, it's a completely deep, different mark- uh, market. 
Uh, so it's a live tool. It goes to production. And we were a tooling company for developers. And this is a completely different business. So in order to actually roll out uh, this kind of software, you need mm-hmm. consultants to go on site, do training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You need to offer SLAs. You need to offer enterprise support. And this is where we couldn't scale mm-hmm. as a small company. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? Yeah. This is maybe where we met more often because I completely forgot that you worked for Jerable. Because uh, this is, I, I knew and I, I know you from somewhere, but uh, maybe you know we met at the BA World or some something or the BA time or may, maybe be a Web Logic time, because I work a lot with Web Logic, enjoyable not, but I was really interested. I was um, you know on every conference uh, the Afghani approached me and we had a chat you know about architecture and stuff like that, and uh, maybe I had a chat with you because I know you from somewhere. And it's like we, we we spent some time with each other, but I had no idea where it was, right? And one was the our our shootout uh, NetBeans versus uh, whatever, and uh, and I think we had also chats with Jerable and Life Rebel and stuff like that because I was very interested in the in the in the technology. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So so what happens then? You you, you quit uh, Jerable or Zero Tino We we were acquired by a um, strange company, I would say. Uh, okay. It was called Rogue Wave. Um, Ah, Rockwave, they, they built the Java collections and, and, uh, and the C++ collections back then. Yes, and uh, right before uh, Zero Turnaround, I think three months before Zero Turnaround, they acquired Zend. So I was joking that they were just uh, following the alphabet, uh, the ABC, and got to the Z letter at the end. Um, and uh, two months, uh, two weeks after that, marketing was dismissed and... Uh, I actually switched from uh, development into marketing and I was pretty tired of Jerable and Xrable as well. So that was the time for me to actually naturally um, go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I I was pretty happy that it it finished and uh, Mm In on the same day when when it was announced that uh, Zero Turnaround is acquired by Rogue Wave, I got an offer from JetBrains uh, because they knew me for all the presentations about IntelliJ long before. Ah, okay. And which we which year was it? Two, it's, it was uh, the end of two thousand seventeen, and it was exactly six years ago. Oh, so you have your six years cadence. Yeah. So tomorrow you will quit and join something else. Right? So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> cannot con- cannot confirm or deny. But uh, but yeah, I, I basically started six years ago at JetBrains. What was your role at JetBrains? Or what was your what were you supposed to do? The 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 thing is, like all the companies uh, who knew me, like all the people who knew me, not only at JetBrains but elsewhere as well. Uh, they saw me speaking at the conferences, uh, but that wasn't my primary role. So my primary role was a product manager. And all okay. uh, well, startup, you just do what you got to do to succeed, right? And so I was speaking at the conferences and everybody was thinking that I'm, I'm a developer advocate. And uh, so they were asking me to join as a developer advocate. And uh, at JetBrains, we kind of specialize on, on some technologies or products. Mm-hmm. And I was... I was thinking that, okay, IntelliJ, I was using IntelliJ for 12, 14 years at that time already. And like it would have been not the smartest move to just do the same thing yeah. over yeah. and over again. Yeah. So I, I was looking for something that I didn't know about that much. I wanted to learn again. And I thought that Team City would be an mm-hmm. interesting product to work with because uh, of a DevOps movement. Uh, because mm-hmm. it's it's mm-hmm. the CI mm-hmm. server, it's the automation, and Team City is uh, uh, targeting two technologies, like two main technology technology stacks, uh, Java and .NET, mm-hmm. uh, as a CI server. But 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 the main main uh, audience mm-hmm. for or like main users are in mm-hmm. those technology stacks, of course. And it's a big big product, but it's an established product. So I spent two years there. And uh, at some point, I, I thought that I'm, I felt that I'm not contributing that much to the product mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. And before actually joining, I was scanning the other projects that we have at JetBrains now. And one of them was obviously Kotlin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I wasn't interested in Kotlin in a way that 
you know, to work with it full, full time. Because for me, Java was kind of the main language. Uh, Kotlin was nice, but not something that I would spend full time with. Mm -hmm. But while working for two years with Team City, uh, it changed. It changed because uh, in Team City, we have a way to configure your builds and your pipelines with Kotlin DSL. So I had to spend some time playing with that, playing with the language, playing with various interesting situations, mm -hmm. helping the users. And somehow over time, when you work with this, you uh, this sucked me in. Like, I mean, okay. I, I became more and more interested in how the language itself works. I was motivated uh, in helping the team like by providing the feedback, of course. I'm not really writing that much code. Um, to improve the tooling for this, like, I mean, all tooling, not only the editor, but uh, all the, the, the whole experience. And in two years, I thought, hmm, maybe it's time. And uh, Andrei Breslov, who was the main architect and project lead for Kotlin, invited me to join the team first as a product manager because that was kind of an experiment. They wanted to run the project with product managers, with all the analytics, mm -hmm. try to figure out where um, Kotlin could be applied better or not, you know, figuring out which tools to improve, what language features do we need to develop further and so on. And uh, he invited me to join Kotlin as a product manager for server side development. And Kotlin for the server side development is the language itself. It's the Kotlin for the JVM, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, and uh, today we are developing Kotlin mostly like something specific needs to be done in Kotlin, either for tooling or for multi platform or for targeting other platforms than the JVM. So you are you have deep knowledge about Kotlin, right? I I would like to think so, but it so, depends who you compare to. No, because what I what I thinking about, I would like to you know to to reinvite you and just talk about Kotlin, maybe even a little bit history of Kotlin, how it happened and and where it is going, what is the motivation, and you know not not only about the features of Kotlin versus Java, more like you know how it happened and. Uh, because an interesting story. So no, uh... I I was there in a room when it was announced. So I I can actually give you Very a good. historical so perspective it right now. So this is the yeah. cliffhanger. But uh, I would like to talk about that. Um, I, I think uh, actually JetBrains is an interesting company. Uh, what what I think the most interesting product of 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 JetBrains is I think what what do you think is the best one or the most interesting one? The most interesting one for JetBrains. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it depends on your interests, but for me, it There's was one always unusual product, an unusual product which no one has in this, and an unknown as well. I would say uh, you, you might be referring to MPS, but yeah, exactly. But it's not like there there are um, not competing products, but something similar in Eclipse world. Yeah, this was the EMF Eclipse modeling framework, and, uh, uh, and yeah. And, and, yeah. iText and so on. iText, right. exactly. But uh, yeah, but EMF is like Core Eclipse and iText is a little bit outside, right? This was the open architecture where this was different. This was not well integrated like MPS, I would say. Yeah. And um, what I what I also was curious, uh, recently there was a documentation product from, from IntelliJ. Oh, yes. That's the writer side. Writer is interesting. So you're really interesting parts. And, um, but the uh, Swift product is no more support or disappeared somehow, right? No? Swift? You mean... You mean App code. For Apple. Yeah, that was called App Code, yeah. and uh, it was discontinued. And but but discontinued in a way that there isn't this product anymore. But there is a lot of reuse of the technology for Fleet. Ah, so um, if I use Fleet, I could use uh, also Fleet for Swift development. We are currently building support for Kotlin multi-platform. So. Mm -hmm. Just recently, we released it, and actually tomorrow there will be a webinar with my colleagues who will show it off uh, live together uh, using Fleet in a distributed environment. Uh, but yes, like Kotlin multi-platform, the huge use case is when you build apps for Android and iOS, mm -hmm. and there you need this um, interoperation with Swift so the, you could navigate from Kotlin code to Swift, where it's mm -hmm. used, and so on. 
And I, I suspect that the core technology that was used for uh, analyzers uh, for, for app code should have been reused or integrated somehow yeah. to implement that. So final, final thoughts on Fleet, because um, you know, I always wondered, I mean, Fleet is a crazy. I mean, it looks you know, too similar to Visual Studio Code and IntelliJ has a you know, complete own look and feel. And you know, the entire, it will never fly. It will never successful. So also my thoughts. And it's like because uh, it is just crazy. It is, it, but then occurred to me that you are actually not competing with with Java developers because uh, this was actually on purpose, maybe that the, this fleet looks like Visual Studio Code because you are not targeting Java developers rather than the other developers, right? So this was my my feeling. Yeah, like the, the way it looks. Uh, I also had a feeling that um, it looks and behaves as... right. I, if if you download the thing, it downloads the entire time, and this is like. You know, a complete different experience to IntelliJ. Is this more like Visual Studio Code? This is like, for me, it's like a little bit, you know, clone of Visual Studio Code, which is strange because I like IntelliJ better. I would say if I were, you know, uh, JetBrains, I would just, you know, push more on IntelliJ look and feel and try to be different and not similar to Visual Studio Code. But maybe there's the strategy that, you know, you are looking for v JavaScript developers who are familiar with Visual Studio Code. So then, then it's okay, right? The, there are multiple uh, reasons why something is implemented one way or another. Um, the look and feel and the UI and visual appeal mm -hmm. of this thing is basically not that it's copying v v uh, Visual Studio Code, but uh, I had the same sentiment at first, yeah. but I, I was uh, watching an internal presentation about this uh, by our designers, and uh, they showed how you can, with small principles, uh, there is a few principles of how you apply visual design, and um, they showed what would happen if we take GitHub and apply those principles, or take some other UI and apply those principles. Oh, cool, cool, at the okay. at the end, you, everybody would look like Visual Studio Code. It's not that they are copying copying uh, Visual Studio Code. It's just those principles are applied everywhere. The, the 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 way designers work, they learn from each other and they have trends in the way they uh, design icons, in the way they mm -hmm. design layouts, uh, and so on. And uh, th there is a convergence. Mm -hmm. in the UI design, and mm -hmm. this is how it looks like. So if you have used Visual Studio Code and you open Fleet, you would immediately think, of yeah, course, exactly. yeah. that that we are copying the uh, UI. No, we are copying the system. Everybody is using the same system and the same mm -hmm. principles, and they end up with similar okay. UI um, layouts and, and mm -hmm. look and feels. Mm -hmm. The other, the other uh, thing is IntelliJ is more than 20 years old. Mm -hmm. It was implemented using Java technologies, Swing, and so on. And the architecture was like the evolutionary architecture of a big monolith desktop application developed over the two decades, right? And uh, even though it became a lot more modular over the years, especially over the past 10 years when they were well, this is beautiful and fast, you know, P people say Swing is not that bad, but uh, I mean, I would say... Yeah. Inter yeah. yeah, like it, people are still surprised that it's implemented using Swing, but of yeah. course there is, it's a very custom Swing. For yeah, sure. Um, but it's still a monolith, even mm -hmm. though, like modulus, uh, you can say. But uh, the trends changed over the two decades, right? The way we develop software, the way, the way we deploy the software, the way, the way we started working in teams after 2020, the mm -hmm. COVID era, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there uh, like, appeared a demand for distributed environments. Mm -hmm. and, and basically the project started with the, with the idea that how would we develop a new ID if we started today. So it should support distributed, you know, okay. distributed mm -hmm. uh, deployment, uh, collaborative uh, environment mm -hmm. so that you and me together would in real time develop something on my machine, let's say. And for mm -hmm. you, it would be uh, tr as much transparent as possible. So you mm -hmm. wouldn't think about latencies and so on. So the whole user experience would be as mm -hmm. if, the software runs on your machine. 
And uh, yeah, that's why it's not a web browser, right? That's why it's not web-based ID. That's why we have a desktop client. It's a thing. This is client. actually a good choice, I think, because uh, you have uh, far more control, and one day it could be even, you know, native Kotlin <laughs> code. It's yeah, like the 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 whole idea is actually developed in Kotlin. I think some of the uh, networking components are are developed with Rust, and uh, there is a custom framework, custom UI framework for that. Uh, it's not Swing anymore. Yeah. Uh, the, the rendering engine is Skia, so it, it's pretty responsive and, and much snappier than IntelliJ. Um, so they're like architecturally and uh, how you say, like by design, there are two different IDEs. In mm -hmm. IntelliJ, you open one project. In uh, uh, Fleet, you open multiple projects in multiple languages, kind of the way you had workspaces in uh, Eclipse, mm -hmm. uh, but the workflow is different. There are some elements that are implemented exactly as v in VS Code. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, find usages. In IntelliJ, it opens like a tool window with, with the mm -hmm. results. In uh, Fleet, it looks exactly as in VS Code. It opens it in line in the mm -hmm. uh, editor. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now um, tell me about, you know, Sunday tasks. So what you are doing, yeah, I saw on Twitter, you are drawing uh, beautiful pictures with circle and pencil. So it looks like a tube, right? Pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And how long does it take such a picture? Today, with how I draw it, um, let's say a simple one takes a couple of hours. Why are you why are you doing this? It's like it is uh, you, you need some I don't know. Um when when I like we, we get where we started uh, in the nineties when I was swimming a lot. I mm -hmm. didn't have any other hobbies than just uh either sit down at the computer or um draw something. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I was spending like the weekends I was spending drawing and when I graduated from school, I, I stopped. But okay. I, I still had those drawings in my desk. And my friends, two, two years ago, my friends said, oh, why don't you put them up on the exhibition? And I mm -hmm. did. And in the old city of Tallinn and I, in some bar, I put them up. And I sold four of them, Not bad. Wh which was kind of a motivating thing to try again. And I tried, and I realized that I can do much, much better and much more, more complex uh, drawings today, just just because I can. And uh, when I put them up uh, on the social networks, people started to ask, how do I generate them? Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, the the generator is the compass, basically, the pen, so mm -hmm. by, by hand. And uh, I thought, okay, if they are asking about it, if uh, I can generate them, why don't I, don't I try? So I tried generating them with um, processing, which basically is a Java applet, uh, mm -hmm. uh, processing the language. So it's called processing. Um, that's an interesting project for creative work. Uh, I, 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 yeah. This this process, but it's not from you. Processing is like uh, the the possibility, you know, to to draw something, right? This yes. Is like a yeah, 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 and it was pretty slow for my drawings. Uh, so I decided I try it with Kotlin and uh, Compose. Cool. So we we just uh, started developing Kotlin uh, Compose. Compose for, is for Android, right? The like is like Swift UI. There is a Jetpack Compose, which mm -hmm. is um, for Android, but our, one of our teams is porting it for iOS and uh, desktop as well. So you can do desktop with Compose. So, so, you, so, so Kotlin will target iOS as well? Yeah, it does. Cool. We have to talk about this next time as well. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so I tried that and it works great. And I sometimes play with generating those pictures. And when I see something interesting uh, happening there, like in the layouts or forms, I try to re-implement that with hands, not not to sit behind the computers all the time. So it's it's like just a little hobby. Yeah, but a beautiful one. So uh, you should uh, you give me a link and we put to the show notes and uh, in my the list, every listener should buy one of your drawings, right? <laughs> so you have to draw even more. This would be great. This would and, be great. Uh, and your t-shirt is also made by you, I think. No, no, it's I I, I got it because it's so similar, but it's not You could me. draw something like your t-shirt? I could definitely. And um <clears throat> You you were 
immediately so good or or you had to you know to practice a lot to be um you mean in drawing yeah uh, well like in the 90s i spent a lot of time drawing with that but, but at that... the beginning you were already good or at the beginning you only wanted to draw and then you became good this is what's interest me there uh, that's an interesting question because the way i look at it is just a circle mm -hmm. it's just a circle that you draw with a mechanical pointer right Uh, mm -hmm. There is nothing very, very creative that needs... Ah, so you always draw with the circle? Yeah, it's just, ah. just circles. Uh, but the way you combine them, the way you envision the layout, the way you present it, that's something different. This is like... This is where probably the creativity hides. So people, when they look at the circle, what can you do with the circle? This is so simple and... Uh, um, they just don't come up with the idea that you mm -hmm. can do something very complex. Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. Because it was a small, with simple tools, you can achieve amazing things. So, right. Anton, we have stopped right now because I, I have already 20 other questions regarding drawing. And uh, <laughs> uh, and the next time, maybe we start, start a little bit with drawing. And then if there is a time allows, you know, a little bit cotton would be interesting as well. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you. Uh, where people can find you, your drawings, you on Twitter and uh, whatever you are, Blue Sky or whatever. Uh, I, I am on Twitter, Anton Archipov. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like full name uh, of mine. And basically in the profile, you can find all the links. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have uh, an Instagram account with all my drawings. Uh, that's called Circles by Anton. Circles by Anton. Very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. It was a really nice conversation. 